Greetings, Remembrance Community Church. I am genuinely stoked that you decided to join us for our online gathering this morning. And I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 10. And while you turn to John chapter 10, I want to let you in on a conversation that I've seemed to be having a lot lately. And I would refer to it as a major dilemma in modern Christianity. And it's, namely, it's this. Why do so many people that I know and that I see, and, and myself included, uh, have this kind of experience uh, in their church journey? Seems like we become a Christian, and then we're told, go to church, read your Bible, give, pray, serve. And the idea is that if you do these things, you will grow healthy and mature in your faith. And while, while each of these things is a really important and healthy and good practice, so many of us would say that we have not developed in our faith the way that we hoped or the way that we were told. And so I think this is happening so consistently that we have to stop and ask, why? Why is this the case? Or maybe, what is missing? In fact, at RCC, we are so uh, inspired to seek God for a better way forward that we've actually transitioned Pastor Brittany in this season, uh, and she's now going to be in charge of this aspect of our discipleship that we call spiritual formation. So be praying for her and be praying for us as we, as we move forward and be encouraged. We've already discovered a lot of great practices and great helpful things that we can't wait to launch this fall. But here's another aspect of this conversation of why people aren't experiencing growth like we hope. And I think I think this aspect has been really exposed during this uh, COVID crisis. As we're taught, go to church and read your Bible and skiv and pray and serve. What happens when at least half of these things are interrupted? When you can't go to church like, like we used to? Where, when, when, when serving just looks different? when praying maybe looks different, when giving might look different. How do we be the church? How do we grow? How do we stay healthy and become more and more healthy? And here's the point that I wanna make this morning. Oh, it's actually more of a question. Have we lost the central focus that the living Jesus of Nazareth, who lived on this earth more than 2,000 years ago, who died on the cross as the propitiation for our sin. That's a great word. Go Google it. Propitiation. It means our sin and the consequence of our sin was absorbed onto him and he atoned for it on the cross. And then he rose from the dead and now is alive and working as the Apostle Peter called our chief shepherd. Jesus is our chief shepherd. And all that to ask, is Jesus truly our shepherd? And the Bible often uses this language of sheep and a shepherd. And he uses it for how God wants to care for his sheep, for us, for you, for me, for all of his people. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about sheep more than it talks about any other animal. Just for reference, the Bible references cattle 131 times. The Bible references dogs 41 times. And eagles 26 times. And do you know how many times the Bible mentions cats? Zero. Cats are not in the Bible. 
You can Google that too. And so here's what I think this means. Absolutely, if you love cats, if you're a cat person, God loves you. But there is no indication in the Bible that he likes your cats. But there are references to sheep and shepherd about 500 times. And I think the reason is, is because this, this relationship of sheep and a shepherd tells us something deeply profound about our human condition. Namely, sheep need a shepherd. There are other kinds of animals that can run wild. Pigs can run wild. Uh, cattle can run wild. Horses can run wild. Actually, cats can run wild, like alley cats. But sheep, there's no such thing as a wild sheep. Sheep need guidance. Sheep tend to make bad decisions if they're left on their own. Very similar to us as humans. We're that way so much that the prophet Isaiah once said, all of us are like sheep that have gone astray. And humans tend to be like this. We lose our way unless we are following a good shepherd. And you might think, I don't need a shepherd. I'm very independent. I'm self-reliant. Friends, that is not true. You might not realize exactly who is shepherding you. And you might not like to use that language of, of shepherding. But for all of us, someone or something is leading us. Someone or something is driving us, influencing us, and shaping us. And for those of us who are followers of this Jesus, this should mean that Jesus is our chief shepherd. But that is not always the case. Other things take this role and Jesus takes a back seat for so many Christians, at least for seasons within their life. Is Jesus our chief shepherd? And that's the big idea for us today, that Jesus is offering to be our good shepherd. So turn to John chapter 10, and let's dig into the scriptures. And Jesus says, Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And they will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. And Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. <laughs> so here's a few things that we need to know in the in the context, in the Middle East where Jesus lived, especially in the first century, but even today, it, uh, shepherding was a very common profession. And Westerners here, like in the United States, even today, the way that we, we ranch, we, we drive our sheep or our cattle. We get behind them, we ride on our horse, we have, or have animals or, or motorcycles now, and we drive our, our animals. But in the Middle East, even today, they do it radically different. They call them from, from in front. They lead from in front and they call them forward. And many small business shepherds in the, in the Middle East, in the first century, when this letter was written, when this gospel was written, they had a, a, a small flock of, of maybe a hundred sheep. And most of them couldn't afford their, own, afford their own land or their own sheep gate. And so 
it was very common to use the neighborhood sheep pen. And the way that this would work was they'd have a large sheep pen in the, in the neighborhood. And lots of shepherds at night would put their flocks in the one large sheep pen. And then they would close the gate and they had a gatekeeper or kind of like a security guard that would watch the sheep all night. And in the morning, each shepherd would enter the gate as the gatekeeper would let them in. And sheep are very interesting creatures. They get to know their shepherd's call so much and will only respond to it. Matter of fact, I've seen this on YouTube videos and it's so fascinating. A strange voice, not the shepherd, will call to the sheep and nothing happens. They ignore the stranger. The stranger can't get them motivated, can't get them riled up, can't get them to follow. And then the shepherd will make a simple call to the sheep, and they immediately will respond, come to him or her, because lots of shepherds are shepherdesses, they're women. And so let's read our passage again now that we know that. Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, and the gatekeeper opens it for him. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them, and and the sheep follow him because they know his voice, and they will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. And Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So what can we learn from this analogy that Jesus is using about Jesus in our lives? And it says in the passage, the audience didn't get it. It was a figure of speech but they did not understand what he was telling them. And so Jesus explains more with a different type of shepherding analogy. And we'll pick that up in verse 7 through verses 10. He says, Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So here's a different analogy that Jesus is using. You see, some shepherds were able to afford a small pen for their sheep. Usually in in the front yard of a house, the house would be a part of it. And then you imagine a a, a small fence that goes out, kind of like we have in our neighborhoods, probably a little bit bigger, with a fence or a wall around the yard. And often the shepherd would lie down at the gate of the yard at nighttime and act as a door to the gate to keep every wild animal or, or, or thief out. And this seems to be the image that Jesus is using. Here's his his sheep. They're in his pen. And he is the shepherd and he is the gate at the door. But let's do some exegetical processing here. It says that that Jesus gives a first analogy and the audience doesn't understand. And so now Jesus gives them a second analogy. So if we're going to be good Bible students, we should ask, who is this audience who doesn't get it? And actually, there's a hint in the passage, and it goes like this. Um, John begins by saying, truly, I tell you, or in some translations, it says, verily, verily, or truly, truly. Well, here's something you need to know about John, the author. John never begins a new discourse this way. 
He never begins a new section in his letter or his gospel this way. That means that this is a continued story from John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, Jesus heals a blind man in front of the Pharisees. And for nuanced reasons, the Pharisees are offended by Jesus and his miracle. Often this is the case. And Jesus ends up calling the Pharisees uh, uh, blind leaders. Because they, they care more about themselves and their rules than they do about the people who they lead. And that's shown by this blind guy who Jesus heals. And rather than get excited for the fact that he's no longer blind, the Pharisees are angry and they're offended by what Jesus does. They're a bunch of religious sourpusses. And so now Jesus is telling this parable, these analogies about sheep and shepherd, and the audience is these Pharisees who have been offended by Jesus and who Jesus is going to say some things in these analogies that they need to hear, but they probably don't want to hear. Namely, they're not being good shepherds, and Jesus is a good shepherd. And the other important thing to note is that in John 10, they are in Jerusalem, and they are celebrating a Jewish holiday that we now today call Hanukkah. It's Hanukkah. And Jesus starts his second analogy to his Pharisees. He says, I am the gate of the sheep. And we know in the analogy that makes sense because he lays at the door and he lets the sheep in. But what we don't know, if we don't understand Jewish writings and Jewish culture, is that this is a clear reference to Psalm 118. During Jewish holidays, they would read Psalm 118 many times, probably every day. It was called one of the Psalms of Ascent. So imagine these Pharisees have been reading Psalm 118 as part of their holiday celebration every day this week. And now Jesus quotes it and says, I am the fulfillment of of, of Psalm 118. Psalm 118, 19 through 21 says, Open the gates of righteousness for me. I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. The righteous will enter through it. So Jesus is saying, I am the gate that the righteous will enter through. And then he goes on in verse 8 of John 10. He says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. Remember, it's Hanukkah. And during Hanukkah was a time when they celebrated a thing called the Maccabean Revolution. It was a political revolt where they won their freedom. And oftentimes during Hanukkah, these Jewish people would talk about the history of their people. And how every time they were led astray by bad leadership... Uh, God would have to come and rescue them, but there would always be consequences like losing the kingdom or, or being sent into exile or, or all of these types of things. And they wanted to do better. They wanted better leadership. So they would look back. One of the things that they would read religiously during this holiday of Hanukkah was Ezekiel 34 about good and bad leadership, about good and bad shepherding. So let's look at Ezekiel 34 too. They would have, remember, these guys would have just been reading this and now Jesus quotes it. He, it, it says in the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, he says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? Remember, Jesus says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. They're they're bad shepherds, like in Ezekiel 34. And so we see Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the good shepherd. But woe to those who lead others astray. Woe to the shepherds that don't care for the sheep. 
like this blind man who was healed. They only care about themselves, their traditions, their political ideologies. And then in verse 9, Jesus goes, I am the gate. He says it again. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. So here we find another reference to Ezekiel 34. He says, Woe to the bad shepherds who steal and kill and destroy. But those who have a good shepherd, they will be saved and find pasture. Later on in Ezekiel 34, after the bad shepherd section, in verse 30 and 31, it says, Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people. And this is the declaration of the Lord God. You are my flock, the human flock of my pasture, and I am your God. And this is the declaration of the Lord. So we see the people will know that God is their God. And the people will know that God is their shepherd. And as their good shepherd, God will lead them beside green pastures. He'll take them out to pasture, like it says in Psalm 23. Jesus is using all of this language in this story in John 10. And then one more nugget that Jesus sneaks into this analogy. He says they will come out in and go out. My people will come in and go out. You have to know to the Jewish people, this screams God, Mosaic covenant. This is covenant language. This is the language of God to his people. If you read in, in Moses' writing, especially in Deuteronomy 28, I'll just give you one section. It says, beginning of verse 1, he goes, Now if you, if you faithfully obey the Lord your God, and are careful to follow all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will put you far above all the nations of the earth. And then he pronounces blessing after blessing after blessing, and he says, and they will come in, and they will go out. When we're part of God's, when God is our shepherd, and we're his sheep, and we're, and we're, and we're in his flock, in, being tended by him, one of the blessings is that we'll be able to come in and go out with safety and freedom. It's one of the covenant blessings. And so Jesus ends, he goes in verse 10 of, of John 10. He goes, a thief comes only to steal and destroy and to kill. But I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance or this blessed life, this men blessing after blessing poured on more than you even need in abundance. Simply put, Jesus is our good shepherd. Now, all other shepherds are just imitating. And that's a loose paraphrase from the rapper Slim Shady. I'm Slim Shady, I'm the real Shady. All those other Slim Shadies are just imitating. That's what Jesus is kind of saying. He's saying, I'm the good shepherd. All the other shepherds, all the other things that you, that you look to for guidance, and leadership, and provision, and life, they're lesser. They're just imitating. Other things will try to take the place of Jesus as our shepherd in our lives. But Jesus came to give us life. And he came to give us life abundantly as our good shepherd. And in the very next verse, 1 John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life. For the sheep. So let's ask once again 
Is Jesus the chief shepherd of our lives? And let's look back at, at one of the sections Jesus talked about to kind of just, just uh, maybe, maybe tease this out. John 10, 3 through 4, he says, The gatekeeper opens it up for him, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Remembrance, let me ask you this, this, this gathering. Do you know his voice? Do you know his voice? Or in sheep language, this is asking, do you trust him? The sheep hear his voice and they trust him. That's why they immediately run to him. Because they're scared and they don't know what to do. And they run to him for leadership, provision, and protection. Because they trust him. And in the scriptures, some trust in chariots and horses. Putting your hope And your trust in the economy is trusting in chariots and horses. Putting your hope in what you have or what you can purchase. Putting your trust in chariots and horses. Or putting your hope and trust in your own abilities or your own resources, your own network. Putting your hope, chariots and horses. And in the scriptures, some put their hope in political outcomes. Matter of fact, Jesus wept over Jerusalem in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a sad state of the people putting their trust in a political outcome. They think Jesus is going to be a political revolutionary. And Jesus wept and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only knew today what would truly bring you peace. They thought a political revolution was the answer. And today, many of us are tempted to make this critical mistake. Matter of fact, I've actually read both of these statements this week on social media from local Christ followers, people who claim to follow Christ, and this has been on their social media feed. Here's one. Our main goal now is to vote out Trump. If we, in other words, if we could only vote out Trump, everything would be fine. Another one. I'm more afraid of the Dems in office than I am of COVID. These are Christians. But I'd ask, is, can you relate to those? Do you resonate with those? Friend. If that's true, please take a break from social media. I know we want to be advocates, but the world needs us healthy and and following Jesus. Take a break. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time meditating on Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be afraid. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And I'm not telling you what to believe politically, and I'm not saying don't care. But here's what I am saying. If Trump is the president for four more years, none of those things in Psalm 23 will change if Jesus is your shepherd. And if the The Dems take over. None of those things in Psalm 23 will change if Jesus is our shepherd. And if either of those things happen, and one of them will, and Jesus is not our chief shepherd, well, then we had a false hope. We'll be let down. Those are not our hope And our trust is your trust in Jesus as your 
and my chief shepherd. Many people, ideals, political ideas, or things can take the place of Jesus as our shepherd. But his sheep know his voice because he calls them by name. Here's a great leadership quote. I heard it from uh, uh, John Maxwell, I think, but I don't know who is the originator, but it's a great quote, and it goes like this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, friends, Jesus lays down his life for us, his sheep. He knows us by name. Is your hope and your trust in Jesus who showed us how much he cares? So we should care infinitely about what he knows and how he desires to follow us and lead us. We should desire to be close as we can to Jesus. And his sheep know his voice and they follow. In the Hebrew language, it's interesting, there is no specific word for obey. Well, actually, there is a word for obey, but it's the same word that, that we translate as listen or hear. It's the word shema. To listen to the Hebrew, to hear to the Hebrew is to obey and to follow. It's to follow through with. You don't just listen and hear, you you hear and you obey. That's what it means here. They hear his voice and they follow. Friends, what voices are we listening to during this time of craziness? There is so much noise. There are so many voices. And it's changing and it's confusing and it's frustrating. And there are so many opinions. So how can we as God's sheep be listening for our shepherd so that we can hear his voice and immediately run to him and follow? I honestly believe that this is the key element that is missing in our discipleship. We go to church, but do we go to church eager to listen to God's voice? I'm here at church, even this morning. God, what do you want to say to me? Are you eagerly listening to his voice? Do we eagerly want to obey his voice. God, show me what to do this week. I am yours. I want to follow you. I will do whatever you tell me. I'm listening, ready to obey. When we do hear his voice, do we immediately run to him to follow him like a sheep? When we read our Bibles, Do we eagerly listen to God's voice? God, Holy Spirit, teach me something here. I am listening. I am not just here to do this as a check off the box. I need to hear from you. Do we come eager to obey what we're reading? When we hear his voice in the scriptures, do we immediately repent or or run to him to follow When we give, do we begin with a posture of eagerly listening to God's voice? How much do you want me to give? Who do you want me to give to? Where do you want me to give? How do you want me to invest? I want to be a good steward. Do we come eager to obey and follow whatever he might say? When we serve, when we pray, when we worship, Are we sheep with a shepherd? So church, let's just take a moment together on this online gathering 
before we enter into a time of musical worship, I want to invite you to close your eyes, wherever you're at, unless you're driving. Close your eyes. Or if you have kids that are getting too close to a light socket, keep your eyes open then. The rest of you, let's close our eyes. I want you to imagine that we are his sheep. Maybe take a deep breath right now. We're his. We're his sheep. And imagine we are in the sheep, pain, uh, the sheep pen, gated in for the night. We're waiting for morning to come and our shepherd to come get us. And let's just sit here in a posture of waiting. Jesus is our good shepherd. We are here. We are waiting. We are listening for your voice, God. We want to hear from you, God, our shepherd. We want to run to you as soon as we hear your voice. We want to follow you. We want to worship you. We're sitting here and we're asking you, God, come speak. Come call us. Come shepherd us. Come minister to us. Church, let's just sit in that for a moment. And now let's just turn to Jesus like his sheep, like he's our shepherd. And let's get excited about being his sheep. And let's praise him right here in his presence. Jesus, come now. Meet with us. Call to us. Shepherd us. As we join together online, we're going to sing praise to you. Minister to us. Soothe our hearts. Minister to our souls. Uplift us where we need to be uplifted. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Free us in the areas where we need freedom. We need you like a sheep needs a shepherd. And you are our good shepherd. Amen.